Thank you, Jessica, and thank you for your work on today's program. And thank you for joining us today. We're excited about this conversation. We have three dynamic panelists. The Chamber of Commerce has had diversity and inclusion as a part of our work for years. But this year, at the very start of our year, second week in January, our board, led by board chair Cheryl Neely, decided this year we need to be intentional and make diversity and inclusion an intentional priority. And I'm glad to say two of our board members are leading the way. We are, uh, it is my pleasure now to introduce our vice chair of our board of directors and incoming 2021 chair and co-chair of our diversity and inclusion committee, David Smith. Thanks so much, Pat. Uh, as Pat has mentioned, my name's David Smith. I'm the vice chair of the Union County Chamber of Commerce and the co-chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee. On behalf of the Union County Chamber of Commerce and the Union County Human Resource Association, who is partnering with the Chamber to host this event, it is my pleasure to welcome each one of you and to thank you for your virtual presence with us today. We are grateful that you have decided to participate in a conversation about diversity and inclusion. As Pat mentioned in January, the executive, at an executive board meeting, at the prompting, at prompting of our chair, Mrs. Cheryl Neely, the members of the executive board decided to undertake the formation of a diversity and inclusion program. With the leadership of our chamber's president, Mrs. Pat Kale, we have been able to assemble a dedicated and talented group of volunteers who are working extremely well together uh, and are responsible for getting us to this point today. I want to thank Mrs. Yorda Kadani, owner of Digital Tax Advisory, and Mr. Harry Patel, owner of the Austin Drug, for an outstanding job in organizing our inaugural event and for volunteering to serve on the Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Additionally, I want to thank Cheryl and Pat for their leadership and each of the diversity and inclusion volunteers for what they have already done and for their willingness to make a difference in our community. Now before chamber member and co-chair of the diversity and inclusion committee, Dr. Melita Mitchell, assistant dean of the Metropolitan College at Johnson C. University, Johnson C. Smith University and a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated introduces the extraordinary panelists we have the good pleasure of having in our presence today. I would like to share the mission and vision statements of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Our mission is to bring awareness of diversity and inclusion by, by empowering our members and community at large. And our vision is to advance equal opportunity in Union County. Dr. Mitchell. Please introduce our guest panelists. Thank you so much, David. It is a pleasure to co-chair this committee with you and to introduce our panelists today. First, we have Dr. Sergio Castillo, who was raised in Barcelona, Spain, and moved to the United States at the age of 18. He holds a PhD in economics from Colorado State University and an MBA from the University of Memphis. He has been in academia for almost 30 years and has served as a consultant for the Inter-American Development Bank throughout Latin America. He is currently the Dean of the Porter B. Bynum School of Business at Wingate University and a dedicated member of our Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Ms. Kamala Emanuel is the CEO of Keep Evolving Consulting and an executive coach. Originally from the United Kingdom, she spent over 15 years working in leadership development for the British Embassy as a diplomat in locations across the world. These embassy posts included Jamaica, Nigeria, Indonesia, and Thailand. She has a BS in public administration and education from the University of Surrey in London, England, and is a certified diversity practitioner and professional executive coach. Her ability to captivate her audience has allowed her to engage with cross-cultural leaders and build a successful international career. Last but certainly not least, Marlon D. Smith is a dynamic HR professional that is passionate about helping employees and companies find common ground for success. He has a solid background in leadership, safety, and employee culture from almost 20 years in human resource leadership. 
Marlon has been a featured speaker and presenter with the Society for Human Resource Management for several years, presenting at state and national conferences on leadership, diversity and inclusion, and unconscious bias. A graduate of the University of Chicago, Marlon is a Dale Carnegie graduate. He, he currently serves as Director of Human Resources at ConMet with oversight of their U.S. plants. Please join me in welcoming our three panelists for today. And so let me explain a little bit about what diversity is and how you can benefit from it in your organization. It keeps organizations competitive. Diversity is a way that we learn about differences. It's an infusion, let me say that again, an infusion of diverse perspectives and enhances employee engagement. It is not just about representation of multiple groups. It's a way that we can include people to have a seat and a voice at the table that we learn and value differences that they bring to the workplace. And it has been shown that this increases innovation and creativity in organizations to be able to have a diverse, a diverse workforce around you and surrounding you. And so diversity is always a win-win. And let me just say, diversity is not the problem, it's the solution. And so I want to step over to some of my peers and talk about, Sergio, would you like to talk about diversity in regards to what is in it? for these people who are joining us today. What is in it for your organization and why is it important? Yes, thank you, Kamala. When I think of diversity, I think about belonging. So one of the things that um, here at uh, Winge we try to do and for companies um, to do would be to make sure that uh, the employees feel like they belong to the corporation. Uh, when they belong, they have a higher sense of purpose. And that higher sense of purpose then leads to, as you've said, higher productivity, innovation, um, higher employee engagement, lower uh, turnover and absenteeism, which reduces cost. It also increases um, uh, decision-making and um, thinking about the complex issues that companies uh, have to resolve these days. So all in all, um, diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion uh, to me is making sure that everyone feels that they belong to the corporation. And if you're able to do that, then um, uh, again, it solves a lot of problems and it uh, increases sales, reduces cost, increases profits, but not only it benefits the bottom line of the corporation, it is also the right thing to do to treat everyone with dignity and respect. Thank you for that definition, Sergio. Um, I'd like to go ahead over to you, Marlon, to talk a little bit about, Sergio talked about belonging. Can you talk a little bit about inclusion and what does inclusion mean and why is it so important? Absolutely. And for me, from an HR perspective, you know, because I really do try to look at things from the people side of things um, and really think about culture and what does it feel like to work within an organization? Um, again, uh, I'm at my best when I can come to work and be my whole self, right? If I feel like I don't have to leave pieces of myself behind or be someone that I'm not when I'm at work, um, I won't be as productive when I'm uh, operating in that, that kind of a fashion. And I heard uh, one time somebody said that diversity is being um, asked to the dance, but inclusion is being asked to dance when you're there, right? And that's a big difference, you know? Just coming, you know, and being a part of the group is one thing, but again, if I don't feel like I'm valued or appreciated there or that my differences matter or my opinions matter, um, I may as well not be there as well as almost kind of a worse situation for me to be in. So, so from an inclusiveness standpoint, really making sure that not only does everyone have a seat at the table, but um, they've got an, an equal seat at the table, right? They've got a, a seat at the table where they can actually make a difference and have an impact where their voice is going to be heard. That is so critical. Um, and again, as we start talking about why is it important to organizations, inclusiveness is important because that's what makes people stick. Uh, none of us want to be in this cycle of, you know, we hire great people, we spend a lot of time on recruiting, uh, but then if they are just kind of leaking out the back door all the time because we don't have the right culture, or again, people don't feel included, we, we really haven't gained anything at all. So, uh, so again, as we start having this conversation today around diversity, we can't leave out that inclusiveness piece as well, because that's really, that's the glue that holds it all together for us. 
Thank you, Marlon. Um, on the topic of inclusion, so Sergio mentioned um, belonging, you mentioned inclusion. And so if we have the three together, people often think about diversity on its own. You can't have diversity without inclusion. Um, they, are, they absolutely go together. And the third one is the belonging. And so Sergio talked about belonging and, and feeling like you, you're part of the fabric. So you use a great quote of being invited to the party and they say inclusion is being asked to dance. So I take that a little bit further with belonging. An example of that would be, you're asking me to the party and yes, I know that you, know, you may invite me to dance, but belonging is that you involved me in the venue. Um, did I help to select the venue that was gonna be used for the event? The caterers, I had a choice in the caterers and thinking about those people who maybe don't eat meat or people who have special religious backgrounds. And I'm involved in giving my input to know that not only am I invited here, not only may people engage with me on the dance floor, but I actually belong because I feel like I'm part of the fabric. And so it's very important to think about how can we make individuals feel like they belong in organizations. So one thing I said in the very beginning is it's not about just representation, but let me just very be clear that representation is important. Representation matters, but it's, it's more than representation. And so when you, you go and you accept somebody in a role, you accept them, but sometimes you may not expect them. And I say that because when they turn up, are you prepared for somebody who doesn't look like you? And so how do we put things in place to make people feel like, well, can I reach a, a CEO position? Do I see people who look like me in roles within this organization in, in leadership, if I'm not in a leadership role? Can I aspire to be that? And, and will I be supported to be in that role? That's how you facilitate a structure around belonging and knowing that people are included, that yes, you wanna support them to get to that point. So Sergio, can you share a little bit with me some information around what it would be like in your definition to create a space of belonging? Uh, yes, uh, a couple of things. First, I wanna come back to belonging and culture. And um, one of the things that employees need is that sense of connection, that sense of family, that sense of uh, friendship when they go to work. Because when you're at work, you're building relationships with um, employees, with customers, with stakeholders. And so if they have that connection, that makes a huge difference for them, as Marlon says, to stick and to stay because they believe in the purpose and the culture of the, uh, of the company. Something else that I think it's important is um, employees need to be recognized. You know, we all have self-esteem and uh, we wanna be recognized for our hard work and uh, we wanna be respected for what, what we have accomplished and that people notice that we're doing a good job. So those are things that I think are important from, from an employee perspective that um, they need to buy into the culture because they are part of the culture because they're part of the family and they have that sense um, of connection. Now, um, something else that I wanna bring up to is, um, you know, how do we create um, a program about diversity, equity, and inclusion? And I, I would refer to the three A's. The three A's are awareness, attitude, and action. What does that mean? Well, in terms of awareness, that's what we're doing today. Uh, this is not an easy topic, but this is a topic that is worthwhile discussing and starting a conversation about diversity. It's very important, uh, basically for all corporations. Some corporations, uh, maybe they've been doing this for a long time. Uh, some other ones, maybe they've never done it. Uh, but so I think it's, it's a good way to start that awareness by having the conversation. Uh, secondly, the attitude. So here, let me give you an example. Um, you know, we all have implicit biases that we do not know. So we have an attitude sometimes that, oh, I already do that. I don't need uh, this conversation because I'm, I'm, I'm already doing it. But, um, you know, think about when you go to a large gathering uh, and you don't know many of the people at the gathering, but then you see someone that you know, 
So who do you talk first? You go to the person that you know, because it's familiar, because you know that person, and because it's comfortable. Uh, another example, when somebody asks me about, um, you know, do you have any recommendations um, for a specific doctor? You know, I would probably give him the name of my doctor. Uh, and maybe I chose that doctor because that doctor went to a specific school that I admire. Uh, and so we all have this implicit biases and uh, sometimes it's good to check our attitude and to be educated about some of the things that we should be looking out because we don't realize it. And then the hardest thing is action. You know, how to do, how do we implement uh, improvements in our diversity and inclusion and equity programs? And, and that's where um, uh, we could do training and education. We could do an audit of our personnel, of our salaries, uh, who's in top management, how do we promote and advance people? And so hopefully we'll get into that discussion a little bit later. Thank you so much. You mentioned a great word there, culture. Um, and we all know as culture is, refers to our ways of thinking, acting, and, and, and how we see things. Now I'm gonna use a term here, it's called ethnocentrism. And this term ethnocentrism refers to the way we think of culture and we judge others by the standard of our own culture. So we evaluate people by the culture that we hold and our norms and our values. And so by, by doing that, I say that if someone has a different culture, for example, they don't, for example, celebrate Thanksgiving and you may look at them and, and you know, treat them differently or, or find it odd and not really engage around, well, you know, tell me a little bit about your culture. And so when Sergio mentioned culture, that is something for us to really think about because I think that sometimes we have a way of engaging and expecting people to use norms that are related to our own. And the other term to opposite ethnocentrism is cultural relativism. And that term means that there's no good or bad. There's no judgment about it. It's just something different. So, you know, obviously, for example, I come from the United Kingdom. I'm from London and Thanksgiving is, is, is not a celebration. I've embraced it as we moved here but it's, it's not a culture or a celebration that we, we do in the United Kingdom or July the 4th. And so there are many others that exist and that people celebrate, but being open to not judging people about the culture that is the primary culture for you, but looking at it a way to be able to learn and embrace from those differences. And so you mentioned a little bit about recruiting. So this is a great way to segue to bring Marlon in and talk about why it is very important, Marlon, to talk about how to have inclusiveness in your recruiting strategies. Absolutely. And, and really, it, it, it directly relates to what you were just talking about, our whole cultural reference and sense of what our true reality is, I guess, or what our expectations are, <clears throat> because that definitely plays out through the recruiting process or the onboarding process um, and will definitely impact whether or not that person receives that, am I really included? Do I belong? Um, is this an open culture that I'm actually gonna be joining? Um, just from a very practical standpoint, as you mentioned holidays, right? The way that we react to um, whether or not people celebrate American holidays um, or re um, religious holidays that maybe are part of what is our norm, even the very subtle things that we say about it, you know, or the subtle ways that we react to it will be very telling to those people, you know? And so when I think about from a recruiting standpoint, um, definitely as Sergio kind of alluded to, when I go to a party, I'm looking for people that I can relate to, right? <clears throat> All of us are looking for that level of comfort. So whether that's someone that's got a similar background to me, uh, maybe we came from the same area of the country, we all wanna find that level of connectedness um, in what we're doing. So that's why it's so important as organizations for us to really look at who is a part of our recruiting team. If we really are serious about having a diverse workforce, and again, to Kamala's point earlier, it's not just about race, it's not just about gender, it's also about different thought processes, different leadership styles, different communication styles. We really have to be very intentional about who's on that selection committee to make sure that they're representative of what we're really trying to get you know, at the very end of the process. So um, we shouldn't have the same people all the time, right? Uh, we should be looking at our recruiting teams and make sure that, again, different personality types 
um, uh, some people that maybe are better communicators or maybe some that are a little bit uncomfortable in that situation because they're gonna be interviewing some people who are also maybe a little bit more introverted as well. So how do we find ways to make them you know, more comfortable through that process? Uh, the other thing to think about too, which a lot of organizations are starting to do is even using um, um, blind resumes as well. So taking names off resumes as much as you possibly can so that that way you're being as objective as possible. You know, as Sergio alluded to, we all have unconscious or implicit bias, right? So sometimes when we're looking at a name on a resume, it's telling us a story that may or may not be true, right? And it's kind of blinding, you know, the objective nature of that entire interview process. So that's why a lot of companies have gone with that to just make sure that we're looking at, let's look at the skills, ability, the work history, and let's gauge the individual on that first so that we can make sure we've got, you know, as equitable as a, of a recruiting process as we possibly can. So, so those kind of things are critical to think about is we're looking to grow our organization and bring folks aboard. Again, we don't want to waste time by, you know, finding this great candidate that comes in, but then we're going to hire them and put them in a box and say, now be like everybody else here, right? That's not, that's not diversity and inclusion. And it's not also not going to lead to the levels of creativity and innovation that you want as well. So if you spent the time to find people who came from this great organization or had this great background, allow them to use that when they come within your four walls. Um, one of my favorite TED Talks is um, by Melody Hobson. It's called Color, Color Blind or Color Brave. And I love the way that she expresses her thoughts in this because again, we have the option of being color blind and saying that difference doesn't matter. But in reality, if we're brave about it and we just grab hold of all the advantages that these differences bring, again, different experiences, thought processes, communication styles, um, backgrounds and histories, all of that makes each and every one of us stronger. Um, and the last point that I'll make to that too, one of my favorite movies is uh, Slumdog Millionaire. And the reason why um, that young man was able to win was because of all of his experiences in life, right? Even as a child, the good things, the bad things, all those things that happened really positioned him to win that game. And, and honestly, that's what happens with us as candidates and as, as, as people and organizations. Everything that we've learned, all the experiences, um, when we bring all those things to bear within our organization, that's what's going to make us all stronger. Thank you. Um, great, great. I love that. That's one of my favorite TED Talks too. So it was great to hear you mention her name. Um, so we're going to do something that's a little bit interacting because we don't want to just be the one speaking. So Jessica, I think this might be a great time. We want to talk a little bit about micro inequities. So you've heard um, Sergio talk about implicit bias and that term's been mentioned. So I want to talk a little bit about and share with everybody what exactly a micro inequity is. And so it creates an inside outside dynamic. So this slide is, is kind of really meant to, you know, let you engage and look at it for a few moments. And just by the definition, micro inequity or microaggression, they are very, not blatant, but subtle, um, small, but powerful acts that can allow people to feel as if they're not seen. They're very slight and they're very much snubs and they are really set up to devalue individuals. So I'll just give you a moment to read through every slide, that's every section of the slide that's there. And so you see that everybody is holding up a sign. And this is really a, a, a powerful one. And, and we're going to create a poll in a moment. But really, just to have you look in, one of the, the know where are you really from is, is a statement that I have got often through the years. And people are, you know, know where are you really from? And, you know, I may say I'm from London. This happened when I was in London. And, you know, know where are you really from making an assumption. And so how many times have we heard that or have we done that? I mean, sometimes these are things that we've done because it's, it's very much a subconscious. And so it's an example of where we're not thinking about when we say something and it's like it comes out and, and the effect and the impact is, is not what we probably intended. I want everyone to really know that they are absolutely rooted in subconscious, unconscious biases. And so these are things that we all, all of us possess. And so you have to be very intentional about training your mind and realizing and thinking about when you're speaking and asking certain questions, you know, how do we phrase them? And so I think it's a good time for us to do the poll because I'd love to hear about the individuals who are on this call as to how they've ever experienced any micro inequities and how that's appeared in their life. 
So the poll should be launched. You all should be seeing it right now. If you're not, please let me know in the chat. Um, and just to let everybody know that this is a, an anonymous poll. So please feel free to um, begin responding. And then Camilla, if you wanted to go over any of the points in the poll. So basically someone asking you, where are you really from? Have you heard it? Have you ever said that to somebody? Um, really this is, is, is not to, to judge a midi, it's just to kind of get a feel of those of us on this call and talk about how this forms part of our life, sometimes on a daily basis. Um, women expected to clean up, clean up after team meetings. That's a very common one in workshops that I do that women are often said, yes, after a team meeting, maybe they may have a potluck or people being a dish and they everybody leaves except for there's an expectation for those ladies to stand behind and, and clean. Confusing a person with a certain ethnicity with someone from a different ethnicity or the same ethnicity um, and saying, oh, I thought you were, and you know, maybe mistaking their names when it was the other individual. Constantly mispronouncing someone's name, not taking the time to really try and understand what that name is. Um, okay, so the poll came down. Um, I can relaunch it in a minute um, as soon as I, oh, it popped back up, okay. <laughs> Um, so we are, um, let's see, seeing that we got um, one of the highest ones was women expected to clean up after a team meeting, 73% responded to that one. Um, being given a compliment that includes you're not like the others, you seem different, 64% responded to that one. Um, calling a woman honey or sweetheart, that was a 73% one. Um, oh my gosh, these millennials, 36%. Calling okay. women honey or sweetheart. That's huge, 73%. Um, we had one other, um, so I don't know if you wanted to, um, do you want to ask folks if they want to? Would anybody who be willing to, if they did click the other, um, be willing to share what that other was? You can either do so in the chat, or if you just mention in the chat that you want to share, I can give you permission to come in and speak. So um, either you can just share it right in the chat or. Um. And, and as you do that, one thing I'd like to just kind of touch on real quick, uh, the, this piece about constantly mispronouncing someone's name, um, that one really cuts deep, I think, for a lot of folks. You know, I've, I've seen in, in multiple occasions where, you know, it's a, it almost kind of gets dismissed of, oh, I, I can't say your name. Or, you know, even making the comment of, well, we'll, we'll just call you Bob. And that that's terribly dismissive. And even in that moment, that person may laugh it off. Um, but you have to understand that, I mean, again, for all of us, I mean, one of the sweetest sounds that we will ever hear is our own name, right? So it's so much respect for you to take the time as Kamala said to learn some learn to pronounce somebody's name I mean it's such a sign of respect for them uh, shows that just that level of attention and again as we talk about belonging um, you know if I've got teammates that will take the time to just learn to say my name they're just syllables folks right we're all grown adults that can you know put together syllables I think that that's just so telling but on the opposite end of that it can also be very hurtful for some folks as well and I see a couple in here. We had um, always introducing the uh, that person last at all meetings. Um, we have one from um, a gentleman sharing uh, um, other being called honey or sweetie by women. Um, and then converse, yeah, comment about um, people default to calling me only by my first name, but introduce all colleagues by first and last name. Similar to mispronouncing name here, there are times when my name is misspelled, Drew, D-R-E-W versus Drew, D-R-U, when it clearly is listed in my signature line or email address. And so um, one of the things I started talking about was creating an inside outside culture. And so what does that mean? So, you know, Marlon talked about the names, Marlon talked about the names. And so, when you create an inside outside dynamic, it means that I'm not quite part of the, you know, the in group. And so with a, a mispronunciation, um, not being able to quite get it, some of the subtle things that go on, whether it be taking more questions from another example is from men versus women, 
when there are both people at a, at a leadership or team meeting. Those are ways to keep people not ever feeling like they're on the inside. So they create an inside outside dynamic. And so if you are somebody who is, you know, you're in a, in a group that's underrepresented, you're a female, you're a minority, your name may be what, again, we create those norms of what people think names should be. That means there's three things where now I'm, I'm on the outside in those three areas. And so I'm constantly feeling like I'm never gonna fit in because they're so subtle and slight. You know, I'm not, I can't quite get your name or do you have a nickname that I could call you? Um, again, inappropriately that you wouldn't do for someone else. That means I'm always gonna be on the outer. And so they're so small and, and subtle that they have such a large impact, but sometimes they're difficult to, to prove but they can never really allow individuals to show up as their full authentic self. And so when you're creating that kind of atmosphere of the micro inequities and not being aware of it and not being intentional to discuss it, because a lot of this is about intentionality. It's about being intentional about recognizing, okay, how do I ensure that I do pronounce their name? How do I make sure that I am including them? How do I make sure that I address the whole room? How do I make sure if I'm the leader and I'm noticing that everyone is disappearing and it's always the women who are cleaning up after the event. So I have to be very intentional as a leader that I want to make sure the space that I create in my organization doesn't reflect that. And so there's a lot of intentionality behind that. And if you see that, I think that micro inequities is a great place where allies can show up. And so we always talk about the term privilege and sometimes it's, it's said in a way that people feel it's offensive. And I say that, um, you know, if you're awarded privilege to use it in a way to own it, to, to use it in, in, a, in a way of good. And that's a great opportunity in a micro inequity session to say, hey, I, I hear that you, you know, constantly mispronouncing someone's name, going up to them and saying, hey, I think it'd be really important if you, you try and get her name or his name, or why don't you step aside and, and you know, work on pronouncing it so that you, you don't show up. I don't think it's fair that you keep ignoring you know, Sarah or Mary Jo in the corner um, when they keep putting their hand up and they want to contribute to the meeting. So that's where I think you can be an ally and use that privilege to somewhere that's positive so that you can stick up for individuals or speak up for those who, again, that inside outside creating. Because when you're feeling that you're on the outside, you can't really fully bring yourself to your role, to your job. And that means that you show up, but you have an, an element of a wall. And so when you feel that on a daily basis, if you go to work and if you think about it, three or five, four times a week, someone is mispronouncing your name, they're misspelling your name, they're not calling your name, they don't necessarily call at you in team meetings that you may have weekly. That is a, a lot to deal with on a daily basis, as well as performing and doing your job and wanting to, you know, purely just go in and shine. And so if you're having to deal with that, it's, it's, it can be a little bit heavy. And so I would just urge people to think about how their employees are able to show up in those spaces and what can I do to ensure that the space they show up goes back to what Sergio first said is belonging to what Marlon said is inclusive. So how can I make sure that it is inclusive, that they do feel like they belong and that it's going to be intentional that we ensure that their name is pronounced well, um, that if we have a potluck event, I'm not going to say make sure that someone brings pork because that may be something that they're not able to do or not comfortable with. So again, I'm making sure that I'm being mindful of all the different factors that I am being inclusive in my approach. Is it Kim, if I could, one other thought that, that you really um, hit well there is again, that, that whole question around allyship, right? Because sometimes folks will ask, you know, well, I, I feel like um, I have the right mindset, but what can I do? And I think all of us, we sense those moments. There's, there's always that, that little air of, uncomfort or of uncomfort or discomfort um, when you see that in the room, right? When you notice it. So I think from a DNI perspective, if we're all gonna be effective uh, coworkers and teammates, we have to do something about it, right? Um, I, I think about, a, there was a, a young man that was traveling with um, his female boss and um, it seemed like in every turn, everyone was looking to him, right? Uh, because, you know, he was the male in the room, but he was not the leader in the room. And he said it got him to a point where he was just so frustrated that finally he just, he blurted out, I'm not the boss, she is, right? Um, but again, I think we all kind of have to get to that point where when we see those things, we say something about it. Um, and again, from a coworker's perspective, um, if someone did that for me, I mean, I would, I would feel so uh, delighted, you know, that someone understood and spoke up for me, right, and, and took up, you know, 
uh, my cause, you know? So I, I think that's, that's part of what we should all be doing is looking for those opportunities. When, we, when you feel that discomfort in the room, that's a great opportunity to jump in the fray and, and say something about it. And again, that's gonna make your team that much stronger. And, and thank you for, for adding that because again, I think there is a, a feeling around not saying the right thing um, and not getting it wrong or, you know, some people purely don't like confrontation. And so, I, you know, one thing I want to say is diversity is, is just not a tick box exercise. And I think for all organizations to realize that it may have been in the past, but it is no longer acceptable to have that mindset now. And one of the key things I tell individuals is don't think of it as a confrontation, it's a conversation. And so if you go into it saying it is not a confrontation, it's a conversation that removes some of the fear, um, not, maybe not all of it. And knowing that you can, an example could be, you could hear somebody, again, one of them I talked about was raising your voice loudly when the person um, can, maybe English is not their first language, but I think we've heard that so many times and someone's kind of shouting um, to try and get them to understand. And so let's just say you heard that in the, the doctor's office and you were you know, standing behind you know, again, being an ally and, and going up to the receptionist and saying, you know, I don't think it was very nice what you did to that individual. Um, and, you know, I, I'm here for my next appointment. You're, you're at least addressing it and then, you know, reaching out to the person and, and, and showing some compassion. So I think there are ways that you can address things that doesn't have to be confrontational, um, but it's very important for as an ally that sometimes there are individuals who, again, they've been so much created this inside outside, it's very challenging for them to be able to speak up for themselves. And this is where you as an ally is, is a great way to step in. Sergio, did you have anything you wanna add on that? Yeah, just uh, on, on a personal note on the microaggression, just to give you another example that sometimes we don't realize what we say or how we say things. And, and here's the example. Uh, sometimes when I meet uh, a person We'll start talking and they say, oh, where are you from? Not that I'm from Spain. And then, you know, what do you do? And we'll continue discussing. And then at some point they'll say, uh, you know, you speak English very well. And uh, so when they say that, I know they don't mean anything bad, but it's one of those things that kind of kind of takes you back or they'll say, oh, you don't have an accent. It's like, well, am I supposed to have an accent because I'm from a different country? And, and, you know, it's those subtle things that people say just because it's kind of part of the conversation, but uh, it can come across as, as, you know, you're not one of us. Uh, we would like for you to be, but since you have an accent, then, you know, you obviously are not from here. Um, and so those are things that if we start this conversation, and we kind of know about some of these subtle differences that make people feel uncomfortable or not belonging, then you can catch yourself before you make some of those comments. Thank you, Sergio, for, for sharing that. And I think letting people know, um, one of the, I, I actually, it's interesting you mentioned the accent. I had that last week on a, another panel and someone was saying to me that, they were just enamored by the accent. And I said, well, versus saying where you're really from, just say I'm enamored by the accent. Um, and so sometimes we're, we're not sure, again, I don't think it's about being perfect. I think it's about how do we connect with individuals? You know, it's an opportunity to foster a connection around something that is unusual or maybe new to you. And so in that tone, just say, you know, I, I love your accent, where is your accent from? Versus where are you from? Um, you're, you're kind of, defining the, the two ways. And it's not the same as saying, no, where are you really from? When really you're asking about, gosh, I'd, or maybe saying, I'd love to be able to speak another language. You know, engaging in a conversation about thinking about what is it that you really want to say and taking the time to do that. Because again, I think going back to his point, you don't really feel like you're part of the majority party. So then again, it seems like the, the culture of the wider group is the accepted culture. And so if I'm not part of the wider group, I'm again on the outside. And so I'm never going to be able to be part of the wider group. So that means I can never fit in. So that means I will never belong. And so being able to, how do you show up every day with those thoughts and feelings and emotions around are, are a challenge. And so I want to talk a little bit about how you can measure in your organization tools to look at, to see, okay, 
how are we making sure and ensuring that we are creating a culture around that? Marlon, do you want to speak to that? Absolutely. And I think there's, I like to approach it from two different ways. So first of all, um, and, and Sergio kind of talked about, you know, attitude and action, you know, earlier. I think that's one of the things that we should all be doing is saying, okay, what are we actually engaging ourselves in, right? So if we're going to measure, you know, how, how many times are we having these conversations with our employee base, um, you know, how, how many affinity groups have we created and how often are they meeting? How many people are attending those types of things? Uh, how many training sessions, you know, whether it's around unconscious bias, implicit bias, um, whether it's around, you know, privilege, you know, how many of those uh, opportunities are we creating? Because I think that's, that's a great start to say, are we creating that awareness, right? That's, that's our baseline to say, are we gonna move the ball forward? But then the other piece of it is the actual metrics and data of it. And, and this, this kind of gets um, uncomfortable for some people because they start thinking it is about quotas, right? And as, as Kamala said earlier, it's not about the quotas necessarily. It's about, you know, are we moving the needle, you know, yes or no? And so I think all of us have the information at our fingertips to take a, a good objective look at our organizations. And let's look at who's in leadership roles, you know, and again, look at it from a variety of different angles. Uh, let go beyond just race and gender. But let's look at abilities again. Let's look at you know different communication styles. Let's look at backgrounds. Um, you know, for some of our organizations, maybe it's good for us to look at you know have we brought in folks from other industries as well, so that we can have diverse diverse thought as well um, in, in what we're doing. Um, so again, we're, we're going to look at those leadership levels. We're going to look at also from a promotion standpoint. Let's just take a good objective look and say you know over the last two two to three years. Who's been promoted within our organization? And then what does that tell us, right? Um, because it may be very telling as you look at that data and you say, wow, we, um, we thought that we were doing pretty well from a diversity and inclusion standpoint when we look at just what our overall organizational makeup looks like. But then when we look at who got promoted, maybe there's a, something that it tells you there. Um, again, from an HR perspective, again, we've got easy, easy ways to look at, you know, uh, look at your comp data as well. What does it tell you also? Um, when we start talking about bias and, and implicit bias, unconscious bias, there, there's a lot, lots of different ways where performance reviews can be slighted based on how we view people within your organization. So maybe I have a certain affinity toward this group of employees because we all golf together or we all bowl together or, you know, we go hunting together, whatever the case might be, right? And so then as I look at performance reviews, wow, they tend to have a little bit higher ratings than maybe the rest of the, the rest of the group. Now, again, is it that employee's fault that they don't like to bowl or they don't like to hunt with me? Well, that, that shouldn't impact their performance review. But as we know, that performance will directly tie back to potentially merits or bonuses, right? So now it kind of compounds itself. So, you know, those people that are kind of in the in-group or the, you know, the inside culture, you know, as Kamala mentioned, um, better performance reviews, better money. And again, now that it kind of compounds from a wealth standpoint and so on and so on. So looking at those kind of metrics is going to be critical as well. Uh, but then also as we go and look at what are we doing from a recruiting standpoint? And this is where from a leadership standpoint, you really should be taking a good stock on what does my recruiting pool look like? Is it diverse to begin with? Uh, because if your recruiting pool is not, when you start that, that process, you're never going to get to a point where down the road you've got folks that are being promoted or leaders in your organization um, that are gonna show that level of diversity that you're looking for. So again, some of it is just the raw data. Now, once you have that information, that's when you as a leadership team need to have a conversation about what you want to do with it, you know, where you go from there. And again, that's not to say that, well, you know, we're gonna set a number, you know, to say, hey, we want, you know, three females in leadership, you know, by the next five years. Um, but I think it really is about changing those systems so that organically you'll start to see that, that level of growth. And as you look at your metrics, you'll see that things are changing for sure. And to, to follow up on uh, Marlin's comments, a couple of things. One is when it comes to training and education, you know, uh, companies should spend the time uh, to educate uh, their employees about some of the things that we've been talking about. But more importantly, uh, they should have a system or a process to where if somebody sees in the workplace that there is a problem, that there is a way to be able to report that problem and that then it's investigated and something is done. Uh, there's many times where um, we hear and see things all the time, but we dismiss it and we don't do anything 
in part because we don't know what, how to do it and how to report it. So I think it's very important to uh, educate and train employees and also give them a process to where if there is uh, something that they would like to report that they can to, to HR and then uh, you know, follow the process, whatever the process may be. The second thing is about promotion and advancement. So yeah, evaluations sometimes um, are subjective because of some of the things that Marlon was talking about because we golf together, because we go hunting together. And so some people may get promoted or advance sooner than others because of those things, which probably we should have a process where that doesn't happen, but that's tied then to merit and salaries. And the more you do that, then the more you're gonna have salary inequities. Uh, and you know how salaries, uh, it's something that you can't discuss and you can't share, um, but everybody probably knows that somebody makes more than somebody else. And uh, we always wanna know, you know, how much uh, does he or she make and why do they make more than I do? Uh, and part of solving that would be having a promotion and advancement process to where it's more equitable and more objective, which then will not cause those salary inequities. Great points. Um, one of the things I often hear is, and I'm sure Mullen has heard the same is, you know, I, 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 don't, I can't find a diverse pool of candidates. Um, you know, we've tried and really, I mean, I've, I've tried to, but I, I'm just not able to find a diverse pool. And so my first question is, well, where are you advertising? And, you know, I'm, I'm, I find it odd that, you know, we can't find qualified candidates from a, a number of backgrounds. So looking at where you're advertising, looking at how and, and who are you, you know, talking about your vacancies to. Sometimes it's within a small group or again, it's in small networks where there's only a certain type of individual people who are in that network. And so, again, what are you doing differently to get a different result? Because if you're doing the same thing, you're going to get the same result. So it goes back to that word of intentionality, but a great point in regards to what Sergio mentioned in regards to accountability, in regards to performance evaluations is your leadership. And so when we say that we want to have an inclusive environment and that we value diversity, well, do our senior leaders, are they aware of, of those values and how are we holding them accountable? So there has to be accountability. And so what does that look like? That means that their evaluation, they need to be evaluated on how inclusive and diverse that they are and showing some metrics around what that looks like. And again, it's not about quotas. It's about, okay, you, you say that, you know, you may have a year and, and you say that you really want to maybe encourage because at the top level, they're all senior, they're all males and, and maybe they may be all white males. And so what are you doing? Are you offering any employee resource groups? How are we being intentional about developing those individuals from those underrepresented groups to achieve certain levels and do we put any funding behind or do we just say yep you guys can create a group but we don't really give you time to attend meetings we don't put any funding behind it we don't partner with hr to allow you to form a policy and we don't set anything up such as a mentoring program to make sure that people know yes Kamala, I'm, I'm mentoring you to get to that senior level role and i'm putting steps in place so that you can see the vision that oh wow sergio wants me to get there he's not just saying it he's doing the steps to allow me to get there. And so having accountability and ensuring that those leaders around you know that yes, this is the expectation and they're also gonna be assessed on it, I think helps to tailor for people to be able to, yes, not just talk the talk, but actually put something behind it. So again, it's looking at your policies, it's looking at your procedures and it's in ensuring that those leaders have training because they may not understand the importance of diversity like we talked about in the beginning like what's what's in it for me i think we've been doing great i think you know the company's been doing great we, we've been doing you know our profits are good we, we're kind of you know we, we haven't had any issues and so people think well if we haven't had any issues so the question is what have you been missing you know and so you you think it's been great but what have you been missing and so it's it's again when you have a boardroom of individuals who are contributing who do we hear from but who are the ones that we don't hear from who are the ones that we're not inviting to the table? Those are always my concerns. You know, the, the millennials who we think, oh my goodness, they couldn't possibly know that they're, they're way too young, but they may come with some bright ideas that take us to the next level. 
and, and they have a different thought process around diversity and they really like diversity of thought. Are we missing those at the tables? Because we only believe that you have to have tenured employees who can add value and are seasoned and they know the organization. And so we have to have a shift in our, in our mindset. And so my question is when people say that, I think we've been doing, we've been doing just well, we, we seem to be doing okay is, you know, okay isn't the ceiling. And so let's always aim for the ceiling, but also what have you been missing? And sometimes you don't know what you've been missing until it's presented to you. And then you realize like, wow, um, you could take, we could be taken to a whole other level and diversity and inclusion and creating that kind of inclusive workplace shows that yes, we can reach levels that we've never thought about. So Marlon, did you want to add anything on that? Yeah, uh, and, and two things that, that I'll add to that. Um, first of all, in this whole thought process of just um, getting different thought processes involved in the room, right? As a leader, I think it's so important for you to create spaces for everyone's voice to be heard. Um, and, and really, even for those people who may be a little bit more introverted, um, sometimes they have the best ideas. You know, just because they're the quietest person in the room doesn't mean that they're not terribly competent and, and intelligent and, and have a lot to bring to the table. But just because of maybe how they were raised, um, how they got socialized, they may not be apt to interrupt everyone or, you know, just kind of really, uh, you know, kind of take over the room, but they may have some great ideas. So as a leader, I have to be very cognizant of that and make sure that before I shut out a meeting or before we make a decision, have I heard from everyone on my team? But then also don't make the assumption that the loudest person in the room is, is also your, your most competent. Because uh, again, that could also be, you know, from upbringing, you know, maybe I was, I was the youngest of eight brothers and sisters. So I learned, you know, through life that if I don't yell and speak up, I'm not going to get heard. Um, but, but again, I don't want to over, you know, overestimate, you know, what, what that brings to the table as well. So just again, as a leader, making sure that we do hear from everybody, um, because the Cam Camel's point. If I don't get every idea, what am I leaving on the table? You know, that, that million dollar idea could still be there, you know, in the room, but I just haven't harnessed it. And then just the other, the other piece of, you know, just this whole conversation around just, um, you know, again, diversity of thought, making sure that we're hearing from everybody from a leadership perspective is just so important because again, um, that's where you're really gonna get the benefit of everybody that you've brought to the table. Um, you probably had a pretty, um, intense selection process. Uh, you were very serious and intentional about who you asked to join your team. So again, the worst thing that you could possibly do is then now not let them flourish and be what you hired them to be. Um, so, so again, I, I think it would be just really kind of um, uh, detrimental for any organization to think that we've made it, um, but always look for those opportunities to learn more from your people, get more voices included, and even step outside your normal circle uh, from an HR perspective. I should reach out to people in engineering, people in finance, people in safety, you know, to try to get their input on things because sometimes even as HR professionals, we start to think the same way, right? Um, so even like looking outside your disciplines, um, if you're a leader of an organization, talk to people who are outside your industry. Um, free plug for Pat Kale and, and the chamber here, right? You've got all these leaders available from multiple industries, you know, talk to them. They may be in hospitality, they may be in medical, but you're gonna learn something from them. And so again, that, that, that's, that's really what this whole conversation is about. So uh, we just don't wanna make an assumption that we're not gonna learn from somebody. Everybody has something to share with us. To, to follow up on Marla's point on uh, leadership, uh, a couple of things here. When you engage in these activities of diverse, uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity, you have to be authentic. You can't do it just because it's the thing to do these days because that's what everybody's talking about. So we'll just check the box and then we'll move on to something else. So you have to be authentic on, on this process that you really believe in it and that you're gonna do this for the long term. Because once you get started, it's not something that you do today and next month it's over. This is a long-term process that will last forever uh, because again we can always improve so authenticity it's very important and then the second thing is from a leader's perspective is all this leads to empowerment when you empower uh, the people that you work with uh, the sky's the limit and uh, and again as Marlon said there are things that you're gonna learn from people that you had no idea because they were introvert and they never spoke. 
that when you empower people, uh, it is amazing the results that you get. So from a leadership perspective, uh, once you get started in this process, you have to be authentic and then see the empowerment that uh, you can create for your employees and uh, other leaders. And uh, the results can be amazing. Thank you. Um, just to tag on a little bit about what you both said, when you talk about, you know, Sergio talked about empowering. Um, I'll, I'll extend that to say when you value the differences and you create an environment where employees feel comfortable to bring their full selves to work, you create an environment that's full of authenticity. I cannot underestimate and say what that brings to individuals when you when you can show up and know that you can talk about your partner irregardless of their sex, you can talk about your family orientation, you can talk about your background. I know that someone's gonna pronounce my name right every day. I can come in and I can remove all those barriers immediately. And so I can then present my full self. And you know, as to tag on to a little bit about what Marlon said is that I say to individuals, and as Sergio mentioned about diversity, this is a journey, it is not a destination. And so you are never get to a point where, yep, I'm done with this diversity, I've, I've done everything because things change, things evolve. And so on the journey, we're learning new things and we make adapts, adaptations and we adapt to, to go with what we learn. And so just knowing that it's a, it's a long journey and you, you kind of take it in steps and you do pieces of it. And you, know, you could sit here and ask, well, how do I know whether my organization is, is inclusive? So I have an inclusivity checklist that I recommend all organizations do. And it's, it's to check the pulse of the organization. We do exit interviews, which are great. When people are leaving, we get all this great information out the door. But how about doing an interviews when they stay? Like, you know, within their first year, you know, what, well, what went well within your first year? Is there anything that we could do differently for the people coming behind? And those people who are here five years and those longer term tenured employees, are we checking in with them to ask them why do they stay or do we make an assumption? And so when you think sometimes that, you know, I think we're doing a wonderful job around making people feel that they can bring their full selves, let's do a check-in, let's do a focus group. And you really need to hear from your employees and asking them how they feel. Do they feel like they can show up? Do they feel like they have a voice? Or if they speak up at a meeting, will they then be ostracized? And as Mullen said, are they now with their performance evaluations coming up? So I'm not sure if I'll speak up this meeting because I need to kind of get through the next two months and then I'll maybe use my voice after the next quarter because if I say something, I know he's gonna take it personally and be offended, all of those things. So you could sit here and be thinking that, yes, I have a, an environment that is absolutely inclusive, but you need to hear from your employees and they will be the gauge in letting you know about how they feel about being able to show up as, as their true authentic self. Anything Pamela. to add? Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I did have a couple questions. So um, if you, I, I, sorry, you were going to see if people no, wanted to cover that. Jump on in. So um, I had one related to, you guys had talked a little bit about um, diversity and recruiting, making sure you have a more um, diverse recruiting pool. So what's the best practice for that? And how do you make sure you're reaching a broader pool of candidates? Well, I'll, I can add a bit and I'll let Marlon jump in. First of all, you, you're advertising. Um, do you just post on your company website? Do you look for papers that reach all groups and minorities? Do you do radio advertising? Um, the panel of, it, of people who sit on the panel to make the selection, do they all look like you? Um, those are some basics, but I'll leave it over to the, the head of HR. He can add some bits to that. Well, and, and I kind of laugh because I, I'll tell uh, HR folks all the time, I say, don't be lazy HR people. And, you know, just, hey, we put it on LinkedIn. What else do you want? Or, hey, we put it on Indeed. What else do you want? Um, there are so many different groups out there. And, and again, kind of tongue in cheek, but if, if you want to find a group of left-handed engineers, they probably have a club or, you know, um, there's a group for everybody. So again, I, I think between reaching out to different affinity groups, you know, that are, that are kind of specialized to advertise with them, um, look at different schools. Um, again, uh, I, I think that um, Kamala made the point earlier where people say, well, yeah, there's just not a diverse pool out there. Um, well, are you looking in the right places? Because again, maybe you're always going to the same school. 
all the time. And that same school has limited diversity. So let me find a school, you know, um, that, that has specialty programs. Let me look at an all-female college. Let me look at, a, an, at an HBCU. Let me, you know, there's all these opportunities, again, that it doesn't really take a whole lot of extra work necessarily to just post your jobs or to make those connections. Um, again, from a manufacturing perspective, that's the world that I live in. Um, again, tons of groups that we can reach out to where they're, they're training new kids, you know, to kind of get into, into manufacturing. So let's reach out to them early um, because now I'm able to actually even kind of build my own network early on. Um, you know, so there's high school programs that you can that you can connect to. Uh, but again, it really is just about doing the work and not just doing the same old thing every time. We all know, you know, the old saying that if you do the things that you've always done, you'll get the things that you've always gotten. So if we really want to be intentional about moving the needle, we've got to do some different things. And again, tons of opportunities out there. Um, just a couple things that I'll mention too. Um, a couple of my favorite websites, uh, latpro.com, um, diversityjobs.com, diversityinc.com. Um, again, they'll, they post jobs there. They've got links to a lot of other resources. Um, there's a ton of even veterans groups out there as well uh, where you can post you know, and find vets. Um, so again, just so many different resources that are available. All we have to do is actually just put in the work and not just say, ah, I posted it, so I've done my part. Be more intentional. To follow up, and I just saw something on the chat that somebody mentioned uh, the homeless sometimes get uh, overlooked. Also, not only the homeless, but people with criminal records. More and more, we have companies that are making the effort to hire people with criminal records and uh, they have programs to help them um, you know, assimilate into the workplace and then they provide support uh, for them as they're uh, going through their whatever recovery might be. And so uh, that is a group of people that uh, with some support and empowerment, they can become uh, your best employees. And just simply because, you know, they made a mistake uh, at one point in their lives, it doesn't mean that we have to exclude them from the workplace. Mm -hmm. Jessica, did you have any other questions? Yes, we have one. Can you please speak to how we can be intentional to take diversity and inclusion to other areas of our lives, books we read, businesses we support, et cetera? Oh, before we get that real quick, because I, I, I wanted to get this to somebody said, what was the um, first place that Marlon, you said to post for jobs? What was the name? Latpro, latpro.com, L-A-T-P-R-O. Thank you. And so then, I'm sorry, I popped back around. So then the question was, um, can you speak to how we can be intentional to take diversity and inclusion to other areas of our lives, books we read, businesses we support, et cetera? So that's, a, I think, a great question. And if you, I mean, it will translate from your, your work and it should translate into your personal life. And so I can say starting off by checking what are those biases that you have. Again, we all of us hold implicit biases. And sometimes we don't realize they show it in, in areas that we're like, wow, I didn't realize I had a bias around that. So one of the things simple is, you know, identifying who are the top five to seven people who are closest to me? Um, do they look like me? Are they the same gender as me? Did we know each other from college? Is there anyone who didn't, went to who didn't go to college? Where is the difference in just my circle outside of my family? So that's just like a little exercise outside of people who are related. Who are the, you know, top seven people in my circle? And when we talk about at home, what are the, the books that we have? What are the authors of individuals who we're reading? Let's have a look at, let me just take a, you know, a little evaluation of, of my bookshelf, my bookcase. Who, who are the books? What are the last three to five books that I just read? Podcasts, being, allowing yourself to really educate and say, hey, this is an area that I'd like to seek and learn more. And, you know, those are some of the ways that you can do it. Who are the, who are the people that visits my, visit my home? Um, you know, if I was to have an event, social gathering, and it's a small social gathering now with, with COVID, but who would, who would the individuals be that were in my home? Would they all look like me? Or would I have people who, who come from different backgrounds? And if they don't, that's a real kind of question mark to say, you know, why is that? And, and, and what can I do around that? And for, for those people who have families, I would go even further to say, 
you know, who are the, the books that the storytellers that I read to my children? Who are the heroes in their storybooks? Who are the individuals who are the monsters and what do the monsters look like? And really checking those storybooks to look around and see, you know, the, the language and the terms. Some of the storybooks that we've had growing up, Dr. Seuss is one of them, can definitely um, be very derogatory to certain races. And so kind of being intentional when we get something to, to kind of look at it, but also being intentional to make sure we buy books that are diverse for our children. And so those are just some ways, and I'm sure that my other panel members can jump in. On a personal note, um, I can tell you that, so when I meet someone from Spain, you know, it's almost like we become best friends because we have something in common. And so I'll spend a lot of time talking to that person because we're from the same country. One time I realized that probably uh, I would never be friends with that person if I were in Spain. But because I'm in a different country and because that person is from the same place that I was born, now we become best friends automatically. And I don't know this person from Adam. So I made the personal decision that I would try to meet as many people as I can that are not like me, that they're from a different country, that they have different types of jobs, that different uh, ethnicities, uh, they like different uh, uh, food, whatever it may be. Uh, but that was a personal choice that I made long time ago when I realized that it was kind of silly that I was making this person from Spain my best friend when I knew nothing about this person. And it was just because we just happened to be from the same country and we were in a different country. So it has to be a conscious decision that you make in wanting to explore diversity in your own life. And the other thing that I think about too is, as you mentioned, even you know, uh, different books that you may have in your house. I think that there's a lot of opportunity for us to use media in a good way, um, so that we can really learn more about other cultures and other people, other walks of life. Um, you know, even if where you live isn't very diverse, or you know, your, your neighborhood isn't very diverse, um, there's lots of good ways for you to learn more about other cultures. One of the things that we try to do, even with our children, is to like if if they want to learn, you know, hey, what does a traditional you know Chinese wedding look like? Well, there's a resource out there. Let's find it. Let's watch it together, right? So we learn more about other cultures so that even if they never have a chance to, they may not have a, a friend or somebody that they're going to experience that with, they've had an opportunity to learn it now as a child so that hopefully that opens their eyes when, you know, later in life. So again, we're kind of breaking down maybe any bad biases or, or, in, or opportunity for bad biases to take root, you know, even early on. Even for us as adults, though, it's still not too late to do that because I think there's probably some some bad data points that our brains may have right now that we need to challenge because of things that we've seen or heard in the past. Um, one of the, a guy that I work with, um, he he noted that um, when he saw the movie, um, and I talk about movies a lot because media, I think media, you know, is important and it, it can be a very powerful tool. But he talked about the fact that when he saw um, the movie Crazy Rich Asians. Um, he said, that was the first time that I've seen people like me represented in a kind of a non-stereotypical way where you just got to meet people as people, as their own individual characters. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm a grown man at this point, and it's taken all this time for that to happen for me. So, so I think there's definitely opportunities for us to kind of branch out. Um, watch movies that, you know, are made by people of other cultures and, and just kind of learn, learn a little bit about, you know, what that culture is like and what, you know, what they find funny or what they find humorous. Um, but I think when we do that, we realize that we're not so terribly different at the end of the day. Um, and that kind of breaks down some of those maybe uh, biases that we may have. Jessica, any more questions? I don't have any right now. Um, just a reminder, if you guys do have some, you can put them in the Q&A panel and I will be monitoring that. Okay, um, just to read a comment, I think there was a Q&A, somebody was just really commenting on the pronunciation that they found that was you know, really powerful. And it's obviously something that touched a lot of the participants on the call today, just because I think most of us with unusual names can appreciate that we've 
had to, you know, show people how to pronounce it, which, which isn't an issue, but really um, some of the comments on the feedback were just teaching even their, their children and speaking up and saying, hey, I'm not sure if you realize, but my name is pronounced this way and being comfortable to do so. One of the things I, I want to mention around inclusion is can, and you know, we've talked a little bit about what that looks like and bringing your full self to work. Let's talk about the, the benefits of an organization when you have somebody being able to show up and feel like they're included. Sergio talked about it a little bit, but Marlon, would you like to continue on that topic? Mm -hmm. Well, and it's interesting. I think with the year that we've all had right now um, with COVID and economic issues and things of that nature, I think we're all realizing how busy our headspace can get and how difficult that can be, you know, to focus and really be your best self. So now imagine if, if that's the way that you live at work on a day-to-day -day basis because your headspace is cluttered with, you know, worries or concerns about, you know, am I received properly? Um, am I dressed appropriately? Um, because these are real questions that people have to ask themselves sometimes, you know, is someone gonna make a comment about my hair? Is someone gonna make a comment about what I'm wearing? Um, it's Ash Wednesday. Will, will someone make a comment about, you know, something on my face? You know, those are little things that, again, they kind of drain your focus every day uh, when you're coming to work. So from an inclusiveness standpoint, what do we do as an organization to make sure that we don't just say that, you know, inclusiveness matters to us or that everyone is accepted, but what are those little ways every day that we show people that that matters? Um, I think it starts with us being able to show it um, in our any visuals, you know, any representation of our organization. Do, do we see different people uh, represented there? I think it also shows in what we celebrate. Um, again, I mean, I know we all have our typical U.S. holidays, but you know, um, Diwali just passed. Um, did any of our organizations mention that? You know, I mean, that's a, it's a huge holiday. Um, so, I mean, do we take those opportunities so that you know it's mentioned and then it becomes something that's normalized? Um, and then also just, you know, from uh, the systems that we put together, you know, we talked a little bit about mentoring and things of that nature. I think that's so important because um, in some organizations, you may have people that want to grow and want to learn. Uh, but let's just say I'm the only whatever, the only person who uh, that English is my second language. So I don't feel really comfortable going to my senior leader to ask for that mentoring opportunity or or if we're in a meeting i don't feel necessarily as comfortable with just kind of sitting next to that person and talking to them openly and learning so from a leadership perspective from an organizational perspective let's create those opportunities intentionally um, so that you know those are the kind of things that make people feel like i belong here i'm part of this organization i can grow and um and again that's where that's where we get the best out of all of our employees um, but again it has to be an intentional thing and not just a check the box Box, but we understand that there's value in it, not just for the organization, but for our people. And if the people really matter, we'll put the time into it. To, to follow up with Merlin's point, um, I want to make this final comment, and that is uh, people and employees are the greatest asset that a company has. For some reason, sometimes we kind of lose sight of that, but people is what makes a company and what's gonna make it successful or not. And uh, I would say from a leadership perspective that being kind to employees and people goes a long way and it's actually free. It doesn't cost anything. So um, being kind to the greatest asset that you have is the greatest investment that you can make in your corporation. Thank you. Being kind, um, just a, a great thing to just pause on. And, and as Sergio says, it, it costs nothing. Um, on the topic of Diwali, which we just, you know, had some great fireworks over the weekend, that it, I'd like to tie that being kind with that. And so one of the questions that came, how can we do this in our personal life? I'm sure we're all familiar with the, the app next door. And so one of the ways that we can do that is to really encourage, I think, kindness and um, respect again around culture that is not necessarily the culture that's yours and valuing those differences. So we talk about valuing differences and some of the comments I saw a lot around the weekend were, you know, the fireworks and um, the noise around it, but we also have fireworks on July the 4th. 
And so I noticed that on July the 4th, I don't see such comments around on the next door in the community. And, you know, it's a, an annual celebration that's been celebrated for many years and, and even in this community. And so within Union County. So again, that kindness, um, embracing someone else's culture where they're celebrating a festival of lights and, and all that light brings, that how can we create a space where they feel like they're valued? And I saw, you know, so many comments like, you know, thank you so much for, you know, allowing us to, to celebrate when I don't see on the July 4th, anyone saying, thank you for allowing us. It's, it's, it's kind of like a given, like this is America, we celebrate July the 4th. Um, everyone here, you know, people come from all different backgrounds and different cultures. And so how can we be a Sergio said kind and just, you know, be more inclusive and more inquisitive around, wow, what is that? I'd love to learn more about it. Um, we have a question here and I can um, bring this person on if, if we need a little clarification, but saying that we've heard a lot about names, but name tags really help. In less diverse settings, everyone remembers my name. It's very difficult to remember others. What have you found? If you guys want some clarification in that. Let me... I can tell you that, um, so when I'm in the classroom, the first thing that I do for the first two weeks is learn the name of all my students. And uh, it takes hours and it takes the weekend and it takes repetition. And it's hard work when you have perhaps over a hundred students uh, over a semester. But when I call the first name of a student in class after two weeks, they go, wow, he knows my name. Mm -hmm. And that is something that I have done for almost 30 years. And uh, the students appreciate that you, or that I have learned uh, their first name. So a uh, huge investment. Uh, if you can take the time to learn people's names uh, and it's not easy, but it's, it's, it's a huge investment in that person and, and uh, creating trust among you. I think that's a, a great tip there, Sergio. And also, again, it's, it's, it's that word intentionality. So yes, name tags, I think, and, and name cards assist just because that gives you an initial, but just kind of writing it down, making yourself your little um, note as to how you can remember that individual's name. And again, if you're not sure about the pronunciation, I think it's okay to say, I'm not quite sure. Um, I really want to try and get your name and get it accurately. Would you remind reminding me? I think people, can see your genuineness and they can feel it. And again, the kindness around it. And so I think that's accepted. I think one thing that works for me too is again, when I read it, ask them to say it. And then I try to say it back to them again. And I think to your point, when they recognize that, you know, I'm actually trying to get it right, you know, there, there, there'll be some grace there for sure. Uh, but the key is just, you know, that, that honest intention of I'm trying and I wanna give you the respect uh, of saying it the right way, I think is so critical. And, uh, but again, I, again, kind of tongue in cheek, but again, folks, we're adults and they're, they're syllables that we string together. And, um, you know, I, I have a, I have a seven year old at home and we're working on some, you know, some of his reading. And I just tell him, you know, just take each syllable at a time and string them together and you'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. Jessica, did you have any other questions? For nope. Us? Nope. And, and I see we're coming down to it. <laughs> oh, I was going to just say, I think we're, we're coming down to the final road and, and just wanting to hand it over to David Smith to wrap us all up. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> that, that was fantastic. Um, I am so grateful that we've had this time together. Um, one of the things that I'm very proud of is the fact that the uh, chamber recognizes the need for diversity and inclusion. Before the inequities were shown by the pandemic or uh, the protests that, uh, protests that took place in our country this, uh, this year, um, we were already talking about having a program put in place. The timing couldn't have been better, I don't believe. Um, and, and I'm so happy that we've, we've gotten to this place. 
Um, I, uh, again, want to thank everyone who participated today, who took time from their day to be with us. I hope you gained a lot from, um, from this experience. A special thanks go out to our panelists who did a fantastic job today. Uh, we are so grateful and thankful that you were willing to, to uh, participate in this conversation. We're gonna take a break from this conversation today, but we don't want this conversation to come to an end. So we want to continue, um, uh, th make this an ongoing conversation. So with that, I want you to take a look at the Chamber's website. And when you're on the Chamber's website, please click on the, the uh, diversity and inclusion page. On that page, you can learn more about the volunteers who serve on the committee, as well as we're asking you all to take some time as, at, at your earliest convenience to complete a survey that is, on the, that is on that page. And we need that survey completed in order to provide us with some uh, baseline data so that we can measure our results over time. We want, this to, we want to continue to, uh, with this conversation and um, your participation in, in completing that survey will certainly help with that effort. So again, I just want to uh, thank the Union County Human Resource Association for partnering with us today and um, wanna thank each of you for being here. And with that, I hope you all have a great day, a great holiday and um, we look forward to having your future participation with any events that we have. Thanks so much.